All right, so the last talk of the morning, we're going to have Mikhail Lukin from Harvard talking about quantum simulators and processors based on Wittberg atom arrays. This time I went off the slide. <laughs> So I'd like to start out by uh, thanking the organizers for invitation. So it's actually a fantastic workshop, I think very timely. So I'm looking forward to learning a lot. So what I would like to do uh, today is actually maybe make a little bit of connection between what we heard about yesterday and already today and actually talk about our work kind of mostly on quantum simulators using uh, 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 kind of a platform of uh, neutral atoms, but I will also try to make a connection bet between quantum simulators and quantum processors because I think the boundary between these two areas is actually kind of gray. And I think sort of you know ideas from quantum simulators could be extremely useful for actually really you know quantum processing kind of uh, general uh, problems and and the other way around. So uh, here is my plan today. Uh, today I would like to. Uh, kind of introduce a new approach to building scalable quantum system. In particular, I'll talk about uh, work assembling strongly interacting matter atoms by atoms, and you know also making these atoms interact and um, and interact kind of coherently and with high fidelity. And then I'll use this platform to uh, uh, describe uh, realization of programmable quantum simulator and show you how we can actually engineer different broken symmetries and and in study different phase transitions. And then um, as an application, I will talk about using the system for probing quantum many body dynamics. Uh, in, in particular, I will actually focus on kind of our very recent uh, work, you know, uh, involving uh, uh, prob probing quantum critical behavior using the so-called Kibble uh, Zurich mechanism. And in the outlook, I'll try to really make the connection with this kind of, you know, ideas of using this machine for, for example, testing, you know, near term quantum, or testing quantum algorithms in the near term. So uh, as I already mentioned, I will be talking about quantum uh, uh, systems based on cold ultra, uh, neutral atoms. And you know, those systems have a you know, number of key advantages. First of all, they can have excellent coherence properties. So for example, if you think about optical clocks, this is sort of one of the you know, most coherent and you know, most precise measurement devices that man ever made. Uh, um, and um, uh, it's also easy to create a large number of neutral atoms. So in fact, you know, in this room, we have a lot of atoms, you know, uh, flying around. So, um, uh, 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 and you know, what atoms also can be controlled with light, which will come uh, out as a very important thing. But at the same time, you know, this neutral atom is not necessarily the kind of obvious choice if you really want to build, for example, a quantum computer. And there are two key challenges. So first of all, atoms in a gas phase in particular interact very weakly. Um, so and to really, you know, you know, connect them via gates, you need strong interactions. But in addition, neutral atoms are very hard to control individually in large numbers. So for example, for this uh, Example I gave you with all of these atoms in the room, you know, we just cannot keep track of all of them, right? And that's why we cannot use them as a qubits. So motivated by this consideration, a couple of years ago, we started to explore a new approach uh, for building uh, uh, large-scale quantum systems. And this approach essentially involves assembling, you know, the matter atom by atom. So specifically what we do is we start with the uh, atomic vapor in the vacuum chamber and we pre-cool it uh, uh, with lasers using conventional techniques which have been developed over the last 30 or 40 years. And then what we do is we shine the focused uh, beams of light, these so-called optical tweezers. And what these focused beams of light do, they basically attract atoms uh, towards the point of highest intensity, which is basically point of the focus. And so what we do uh, is we focus these uh, beams very, very tightly, so, such that in each of these traps, we can host, host at most one atom. Two atoms just don't fit. And, uh, uh, and then, you know, we start not just with one tweezer, but we start with a number of tweezers, like 100 or so, and uh, just shine them all at once and then try to load them. And then what happens is that, you know, uh, this loading is probabilistic. So some of these traps are loaded, some are empty. So we end up with this kind of disordered array of atoms. And so this disordered array has, has a lot of entropy. So to remove this entropy, what we do is we simply take a picture of, this, of these atoms and figure out which traps are full and which are empty and then remove the empty trap and then just rearrange the full trap in any way we desire. 
So uh, at this point, we start with a regular array of atoms, all prepared in a well-defined internal state. Uh, but of course, we would like to you know, do something interesting with them. For that, we need to make them interact. And we actually, in my lab, we explore two ways how to make them interact. One uh, of them involves basically photon-mediated interaction, where we basically couple these atoms to, uh, to uh, a special photonic system. It's photonic crystal waveguide, and basically they exchange uh, the photon, that's how they interact. But today I will actually focus on a different way uh, where we excite to these atoms into highly excited state, the so-called Rydberg state, which states with high principal quantum number. And there, in those uh, states, the atom size becomes very large and they start basically feeling each other. And so this approach is a, uh, a basis for the collaborative project within our center of ultra-cold atoms between my group, group of Markus Greiner and, and a group of Vlad and Vulnitich. So uh, uh, here is just one picture of experimental setup. So the key uh, element of this sub setup is this device called acousto-optic deflector. So basically what this device does is, is the following. So you shine you know, a laser beam, one single laser beam into this device, and then you um, introduce a number of uh, radio frequency tones. And then for each of these tones, this acousto-optic uh, 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 kind of modulator or deflector deflects uh, uh, the beam by a certain angle, and then basically for the given number of tones, what you end up is that this beam is split into several different components. And then what we do is we simply just take these components and focus it, you know, into vacuum chamber uh, with an objective, and then a sec have a second objective which takes this picture of these atoms, you know, activates a feedback circle and uh, circuit, sorry, <laughs> and rearranges this uh, uh, these atoms in, in, um, um, in the chamber as uh, we described. So this is uh, uh, kind of a group, it's a kind of relatively small team, which we started, uh, say, maybe three or so years ago. So here is how this uh, uh, system works uh, almost in real time. So what you see here is a single shot pictures of atoms. So first we have 101 uh, atom in the uh, array, and we just take a picture. What you see is that there is a lot of disorder. And in this approach, what we do is just we take all field traps and move them to the left. And what you see is that, you know, at, as a result, you get much more ordered array. You know, so there's maybe one atom missing here, but apart from that, it's a kind of perfect atomic array. Uh, and of course, what we can also do is we don't have to, you know, move them in this configuration. What we instead can create is clusters of two atoms, you know, clusters of of, 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 of 10 atoms. Um, and, you know, once again, I would like to emphasize these are single shot images. Uh, and, you know, uh, so these arrays are not completely perfect, but pretty good. So, for example, here in all of the attempts, just one atom is missing. And here in all of the attempts, just one atom is missing. But other than that, they're actually pretty perfect. And of course, we can, you know, vary the, the geometry with each repetition. And, you know, for a small contribution to look in lab, we can write the name. Uh, okay, but now at, at this point, the atoms are completely classical. There is no quantum so, uh, aspect of this. So to, to introduce an interesting quantum aspect, what we do is we excite them into the Rydberg states. And uh, the uh, Rydberg states have two special properties, which are very important for us. They have long lifetime. So if you excite uh, the, the atoms to the state with large n, they live for a very long time. They actually cannot spontaneously decay rapidly. And they also have strong interaction, simply because the atomic size is very large. And in particular, uh, you know, for, for example, for the Van der Waal interactions, which we'll focus on in this talk, this uh, interaction scales is the 11th power of principal quantum number. And actually, if you go to n on order of 100, this typical the, uh, um, um, uh, Rydberg state we will excite, the interactions between these atoms are 14 orders of magnitude stronger than, than the interaction between uh, ground state atoms. So 14 orders of magnitude is a big number. So one can really make a good use of that. So the, what in particular, one consequence of that is that, you know, if you start with the atoms which are very far away and which you try to excite resonantly, for example, trying to drive Rabi uh, um, <coughs> oscillations, you know, you, what will happen is that these atoms will be ex excited independently from each other. So these, at these uh, Rabi oscillations will proceed independently. However, if you bring the atoms uh, close to each other, then starting from certain distance, maybe 
something like 10 microns or so, uh, what will happen is that this interaction will take over and you know, will shift doubly excited state very, very far away. And so in this case, if you try to excite the atoms resonantly, you simply will not be able to excite both of them. So in this case, simultaneous excitation of atoms is blocked at distances smaller than the so-called Rydberg blockade radius. And this Rydberg blockade radius is an order of few microns, depending on which number you, uh, uh, principal quantum number you excite the atoms to. So uh, one can actually generalize this situation to, uh, uh, to more than just two atoms. So if you start with the group of atoms, ensemble of atoms uh, localized to the uh, um, uh, length sc scale smaller than this blockade uh, radius and uh, try to excite them simultaneously, what happens is that you can, will be able to excite just one atom in this um, cloud but not more than one. So basically interaction between Rydberg atoms in this case will block multiple excitation. And in fact, what you end up, uh, what you end up with, you will end up with effectively like a two level system where two accessible levels are the state with all atoms in the ground state and one uh, atom excited. And of course, you know, if you excite this um, cloud uh, of atoms uh, homogeneously, uh, there will be no preference. You can excite one atom or another, and you know you will create this kind of superposition state. So the characteristic kind of signature of that is that you know because you have n kind of absorbers waiting to absorb atoms, so the the uh, probability of excitation will increase by n, or if you want a Rabi frequency, will increase by square root of n. And this is the square root of n enhancement is kind of characteristic signature of this uh, dipole blockade. So I should say that this dipole blockade is actually a relatively old idea. So it's actually I was kind of thinking about even you know starting the experiment like this just when I was starting at Harvard, and uh, uh, since but I was not adventurous enough at the time. So uh, so uh, but since then it has been explored in many experiments for applications like many body physics, quantum information, quantum nonlinear optics. So let's see if we can combine this idea with the atom array. And so in this kind of First test, what we uh, do is just we take all of the atoms in the array and excite them homogeneously uh, into Rydberg states. In this case, we use two photon excitation, but it's a kind of a technicality. And so what uh, we can do then, we can just you know, prepare different types of arrangements. We prepare, for example, isolated atoms, atom pairs, or clusters of three, and just look you know, uh, what's the dynamics. And you know, so in each of these cases, so in this case, you see just normal Rabi oscillations. So in this case, you also see Rabi oscillations, but you can you know, even though if you have two atoms, you can excite at most one. Uh, in this case, uh, we have three atoms, but still you can excite at most one. And but what you see is that the Rabi frequency effect, Rabi frequency changes, and it changes exactly with the square root of n, at least up to the point where you hit this kind of uh, blockade radius. So these are actually the atom, the, the Rabi oscillations between uh, those ground state atoms and the atoms with singly excited state. Generally, this kind of superposition state generally entangled states. So I was already in, uh, mentioned, you know, this kind of ideas have been uh, tried and implemented in many experiments. But actually, I must say uh, that you know John's talk provided a very nice kind of background. Here is that you know I will be talking now about applying these ideas to many atoms. But of course, one has to uh, uh, always remember that you know number of atoms is just one metric. So one should also be able to do these operations with with very high fidelity. And actually, this is what. Uh, the combination of Rydberg atoms and atom arrays allows us to do. So let me just give you one example. Um, and this is an example of creating uh, just a two atom in a entangled state. So in order to do it, uh, what we do is we start with just atom pairs uh, separated by, uh, by you know, a large distance and just, you know, excite these atoms into uh, this Rydberg state. So in this case, you are supposed to create the state, this bell state, you know, GR plus RG. Um, and uh, we just need to verify that we actually create this state. So how do we do it? You know, so uh, we first of all can just look at, uh, uh, we, me we can measure the, the, the state of the atom and basically look at the probability uh, of atom in a ground state, the probability to have one atom excited and the probability of two atom excited. And you see what you see here is that, that the two atom excitation is completely extinguished. Um, and in addition, what we need to also, we need to basically measure this phase or we need to control this phase. In order to do it, we simply apply um, the laser beam to one of the atoms and we kind of basically use this AC Stark shift. We basically shift its levels and control the way. And then, you know, what happens is that this superposition starts oscillating between the 
kind of supervision with positive sign, that with a negative sign. And then afterwards, after some period, we just de-excite it. And this actually allows us to essentially measure parity of this, of this, uh, of this state. And uh, depending on the phase, you know, we can really see this parity very, very nicely. And from this kind of consideration, we can actually estimate the, you know, fidelity of the of the state which we measure. And this fidelity is actually pretty, uh, uh, pretty high. So. Uh, it's not, you know, 100%, but I should mention there uh, here a few things. So first of all, um, this already involves the application of three consecutive gates, one entangling gate, uh, single uh, atom gate, and disentangling gate. And I would like to also point out that this is an inequality, and it's actually at the moment our main limitation is imperfect detection. So we can distinguish state. The way how we distinguish the atomic states is that we basically we, uh, we, we, we excite, and then we push Rydberg atoms and just, you know, you, you know detect the state of recaptured atom. So this is, you know, very practical, very easy way to detect the atomic state, but it's actually not, you know, uh, I mean, the fidelity of that is not perfect. And we know how to fix it. We just didn't work on this, uh, you know. And uh, what is kind of... Um, but what's exciting is that this fidelity has kind of become serious. Also, we can execute uh, the gates uh, on a kind of 100 nanosecond time scale, and there is a room to improve on both of these counts. And this is actually in marked contrast to, to early experiments with this platform, where fidelities of something like 80% has been achieved. And once again, I think we have room to improve, and I will already kind of indicate later on in my talk you know, where we have this improvement. But what's most exciting is that we can actually apply this kind of gates not just on atom pair, but on many atoms in parallel. And we, with, you know, and we do it with this fidelity, which actually is really kind of the, you know, which is high. You know, so it's not our best case. It's actually kind of an average and a lower bound of the average. And I would like to indicate how you know, uh, the application of this kind of ideas on the example of of quantum uh, simulator. So here, what we'd like to do is we'd like to implement a certain spin model and use this model to study interesting physics, for example, study quantum phase transitions. So the kind of model which we will uh, uh, explore uh, 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 is uh, described here. So this is an Ising type uh, spin model. So it has a term corresponding to a spin flip, the term corresponding to basically this is like a detuning term, which is like a chemical potential. So n is a number of Rydberg atoms, 0 or 1. And this term corresponds to the interaction. So let's kind of, to get the, f yeah, so yeah. the interactions are nearest things, or? Well, well, you'll see. No, it can be, no, it, no, not necessarily. It can be long range interactions. And you'll see this now, you, it will be clear. So let's actually, in fact, you know, to kind of illustrate what we, the kinds of things we can do, let's look at the zero temperature phase diagram of this, um, uh, of this Hamiltonian, and let's quantify this in two different kind of uh, axes. One will be this detuning, uh, which you know we can we can change as chemical potential. Another one will be this interaction range, which is precisely the question you were you were asking about. So let's first think about that atoms are non-interacting; the interaction range is zero. So then it's very clear that the ground state, depending on the sign of detuning, will be either all atoms uh, in the ground state or all atoms in the excited state. Uh, but then what we can do, uh, okay, it's a trivial kind of case, but what we can do, we can now turn on the interactions and let's now uh, consider, you know, strong interactions between nearest neighbors only. So then we can have, for example, this blockade, you know, and then clearly the state like this is energetically unfavorable. But it's also clear then what kind of state will be, uh, will be favorable. So specifically in this case, you know, if you just have only uh, nearest neighbor blockade, so uh, you'll have a constraint that you basically cannot have two excited atoms on both states. And so in this case, uh, what you have to kind of enter is a state which is basically breaks Z2 symmetry, or in other words, is basically anti-ferromagnetic state, up, down, up, down, up, down. But uh, of course, um, uh, uh, we can now also increase the interaction range, you know, make interactions even stronger, and eventually uh, the interaction will be so strong that they block not just nearest neighbor, but second nearest neighbor. So in this case, you will break Z3 order, you know, and then, you know, you can go, you, you keep, keep going. So this basically is phase diagram is actually quite rich. And uh, it turns out that this quantum phase transitions into these states are actually very interesting. They are very distinct. And you know, in what follows, I will show you how we will actually explore this phase diagram. And so the first idea will be to basically um, try to 
uh, enter all of these phases adiabatically. So what we'll do is we'll fix the interaction range, start with negative detunings, all atoms in the ground state, and then just slowly try to enter this phase. So let's first uh, uh, focus on the case of weak long-range interaction. So the nearest neighbors are blockaded, and the interaction between uh, the second nearest neighbor will be much smaller than the Rabi frequency. So and in this case, um, uh, so this is basically a procedure. So we turn on our laser pulse with negative detuning, approach the, uh, the zero detuning, then go slowly here, and then you know, basically you know, go into hopefully another phase and just take a picture of atoms. And so here is uh, one uh, example of uh, um, basically array of 13 atoms. You can look now at this effect, you know, at what happens in different ways. So one of them is just look at single shot images. So we started with 13 atoms in the ground state and then made a transition here. And then uh, uh, what we see is that every other atom is missing. So this is just one, one shot, one image, you know? So basically, the missing atom means it's in a Rydberg state. So we basically directly create this anti-ferromagnetic order. So we can also, you know, uh, make a bunch of these pictures and try to do the average. So we see also some uh, kind of anti-ferromagnetic order. Or what we could do is we could just follow trajectory of all atoms. We could just, you know, change the tuning, stop, you know, make a measurement. And what you see here is that you start with all atoms in the ground state, at the end, there is this kind of you know, uh, anti-ferromagnetic order emerging, but in between, there is this competition between the orders. I mean, that's what the essence of the phase transition. And uh, you know, I kind of indicated that we can actually program the interaction. So uh, there are two easy ways uh, to do it. One is just pick different Rydberg state where interaction is much stronger. Or alternatively, just bring the atoms closer. Right? That way, you know, for a given interaction range, you know, you more or more atoms will be blocked. And that's what we have done here. So we basically change atom separation effectively, it changes the interaction range. So here was this 13 atoms uh, breaking the two order. You know, if we bring the atoms a bit closer, you know, then we break the Z3 order, you know, and if they br bring the atoms a bit closer, you know, it breaks now, Z, you know, Z4 symmetry. So basically what can, one can see is that you can program interaction such that to result in kind of desired symmetry breaking. But, you know, uh, of course, the question now is how well this, you know, system works. Uh, you know, how many errors do we make? So we can, of course, try to estimate it based on this kind of two qubit uh, gate uh, approach. But, you know, I must say that, you know, there is a big difference, and I think it already was indicated by John, between just perfecting, you know, uh, gates between just two individual isolated qubits and then extending this kind of perfection to a large array. So let's now try to use this uh, phase transition, in particular in Z2 state, in the antiferromagnetic state, as a test how well our system works. And so for small system, say seven atoms, we can just you know, compare our results directly to exact numerical uh, simulations, um, uh, kind of looking at dynamics. And what you see here is that we see actually pretty good agreement in this case, you know, uh, a bit, you know for example, this is a many body state overlap. So we start with mostly state zero and then, you know, basically go into this up, down, up, down state. So I must say at this point, this kind of state probability is mostly limited by kind of our detection and uh, infidelity. But of course, we'd like to increase the system size. And so when we now go to larger and larger system, what we see is that this um, overlap with the ground state decays. It actually decays exponentially. But even for 51 atoms, you know, the largest system that so far we have done this experiment uh, for, you know, we still have significant like 1% overlap. So moreover, if you now look, you know, at the final state and you basically look at the probability of different microstates to occur, what you see is that most of the states occur either, you know, once or twice or never. And there is one state which really stands out. And this is this up, down, up, down, it's perfectly ordered state. It has the highest probability from all of this kind of Hilbert space to, to occur. Yeah. So here, just to make sure, you're just measuring um, the probability of these particular states. So you don't you don't check like correlations or we, we, we do, I will, I will show, you know, yes, this is, I mean, so this is, in this case, we just look for ground state, for overlap with a given state, right? But we have, of course, all information, right? We can, we can measure correlations, we can, pull, you know, build any kind of correlation function. So I must say in this experiment so far, we only looked at Z basis, right? Measurement in the Z basis. This state 
is a tensor product state, right? The ground state. This ground state is, is, is not even a tensor product. It's, it's just it's a product. It's a classical state, yeah. right? It's up, down, up, down, up, down. So basically, so we go, we start with a state which, so that's the beauty of this, you know? You start with a state that you know, and you know what the state that you should end if everything would be perfect. So in between, you have all of these correlations, entanglement and whatnot, and you'll see a little bit you know, how it emerges. But at the end, you know, we know that that's, that's a way for us to really quantify this system. So actually, this, I must say, this is also, uh, this is a result that we published late last year. And since that time, when we were not exactly doing nothing, so we actually we started trying to understand what limits this 1%. And actually, uh, kind of recently, by improving essentially our lasers, our laser phase noise, we can actually boost this number to something like 10%. So what it really means is that in this entire 51 qubit system, we make this transition, and this, you know, the time corresponds to something like a depth of circuit of maybe 30 or so. In the entire array, during this entire transition, we make on average you know, maybe one and a half errors, right? So this kind of indicates that it's, you know, we can do some, you know, serious um, things with that. Okay, but like, you know, there was a question about this correlation. Let's kind of look at this same effect in a different way. So let's now look at single shot images. So initially we have 51 atoms in the ground state and then we make a transition. And then after the transition, sometimes we will get this up, down, up, down, up, down, perfectly ordered state. But most of the time, this will not be like this. And most of the time, what we'll have, we'll have a, an, a, an ordered array, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. And then here is some defect. And then up, down, up, down, up, down. And here is some defect. So it's kind of like a classic, you know, I, mean, I guess it's whatever, statistical physics 101, classic picture of the kind of phase, you know, phase transition. So what we can do is we can really you know, look at these defects, and these defects are like domain walls, and then study, for example, how the average number of domain walls evolves, how the, um, uh, how the distribution of domain walls in, uh, involves. So here is you know, just two, uh, and we can actually we can have full counting statistics for these walls, domain walls. So here is just Two first moments are plotted. One is a, is a, a, a mean a number of domain walls. And what you see is that it smoothly changes as we go across uh, the phase transition uh, from large to small number. And here is a variance, and variance peaks. And this, is, this peak of variance is precisely, you know, reflects this kind of fluctuation. The system cannot decide which state, you know, it, it, it chooses. So that's a point where a lot of entanglement actually is created, or some, some entanglement is created. Let me just be careful here. And actually, this peak uh, is really, uh, uh, the the um, uh, the point where the phase transition you know occurs and actually turns out that this point of phase transition is actually in a good agreement with theoretical prediction by my colleague Subir Sajdi if it's based on a finite sized scaling for this for this specific model. So it kind of gives you a little bit of a sense already that we can really have some unique insights into the uh, into the phase tra uh, transitions. And um, in what follows, I would like to, you know, just, you know, give you one example of our recent work, you know, showing how we can use these unique insights. So specifically, so this is an application to physics, uh, uh, and in particular to non-equilibrium uh, many-body quantum uh, uh, dynamics. So, so there are two ways how we can study these dynamics. You know, one of them uh, is we can uh, actually push the system you know, uh, uh, kick the system um, uh, far away from equilibrium and just see how this, how it relaxes. And, uh, and this is one of the first experiments what we have done uh, on this Z2 Ising type model. And actually in the very first, ex and you would say, okay, Ising model should be, have been studied back and forth, you know, by, you know, it's in all textbooks. But the first non-equilibrium dynamics experiment we have done revealed already a surprise. So actually, I was not sure how long is my talk. So actually, kind of, really, you know, it's a very cool story, you know. But you know, no, no, it's I think it's now. But actually, I don't really. I'm happy to talk to you about this. So basically, it turns out. So basically, instead, what what happens in this case when we kick the system away from equilibrium uh, is that system instead of just relaxing to some kind of thermal value, you know, it actually displays this kind of oscillations, which basically correspond to. Uh, kind of uh, non-monotonic entanglement growth. The atoms get entangled and then get disentangled, and they get entangled and get disentangled. And this is, you know, the horse in a state which is actually in a, in, in a, uh, for the Hamiltonian, which is technically non-integrable. And it turns, and you know, at the time when we did this, um, 
experiment. We actually did not really know what's going on. And it, you know, we published it and it now really stimulated uh, an exciting new kind of, you know, frontier in many body physics. In fact, you know, there is a very nice interpretation of this effect in terms of, you know, uh, the so-called quantum many body scars. It's actually a concept related to quantum chaos. Uh, but in the many body generalization. So it's very cool, but I'm actually not going to talk about this. So uh, 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 what instead I would like to focus on is a more recent um, uh, a study which um, uh, focuses on near adiabatic evolution. So here what we'll do, we'll cross a phase transition at a given speed and we'll vary the speed and we'll see how, ma how many defects we create depending on the uh, speed which we go and what it allows us to really do is really probe this so-called quantum critical regime and in particular we do it using the so-called Kibble-Zurich mechanism. So this is actually a work which involves both theory and experiment as a collaboration with, uh, with Peter Zoller and, and Subir Sajdiv's group. Okay, so let me just say a few words about Kibble-Zurich mechanism. So this is a mechanism which basically uh, predicts on equilibrium diff effects, large scaling of defects, by using equilibrium critical exponents. So uh, if you have you know, a system which undergoes phase transition, so generically, you know, near the phase transition, you know, there is some quantity which you know, diverges. Usually you call it, for example, correlation length. So uh, as you approach the critical point, uh, uh, this correlation length uh, will diverge, and it will diverge as in a, some special way. So basically, as a, as a function of deviation from the critical point, it will generally diverge as a kind of power law with certain exponent. There is also another way, uh, a special feature of the phase transition, and that is that the gap at the phase transition closes. So in particular, if you talk about second order phase transition, generically, the gap will close as some power law of the system size, or you know, in other words, of the of the momentum. Okay, and uh, uh, so these two quantities, uh, nu and z, it turns out really can characterize the you know a kind of universal you know uh, features of certain types of phase transitions. So they play very important role in the physics of phase transitions. So um, uh, kind of because this. Uh, this gap um, closes, you could also think about in the time domain now, this closing gap means that, you know, if you start to approach this phase transition and you try to go adiabatically, eventually this adiabaticity will break down and this will result in kind of diverging relaxation time and this diverging relaxation time clearly now depends on both of these um, uh, exponents. So basically the kind of experiment which we will try to do will be the following. So we will start with in a system and as kind of you know trivial phase and then we'll try to go across the phase transition with a certain speed and you know initially we will stay in the ground state but eventually then for a given speed you know you you will you you are bound to become non-adiabatic at least for the system which is large. And uh, what uh, happens uh, in this case uh, uh, is that if you think about the correlation length, so and then initially the correlation will be very short, then the correlation will start growing and will keep growing so long as you go adiabatically. And then eventually, once you, you know, adiabaticity breaks down, you know, clearly this correlation will start, will stop growing. And the idea of kibble zurich uh, this kind of kibble zurich postulate, is that correlation length in the ordered phase stays the same as, as this so-called freeze-out point, the point where you basically stop becoming adiabatic. So that's the essence of the kibble zurich mechanism. So this kibble zurich mechanism uh, uh, has been explored now for quite some time. Uh, but uh, it has been mostly explored in the systems which are strongly coupled to environment, which are certain finite temperature. So we are interested in the quantum Kibble-Zurich prediction, which should occur for isolated system. And so specifically what we would like to do is we would like to basically do linear sweeps ac across the phase transition and basically change the, the rate, the change the slope, you know, change the rate at which we sweep across the phase uh, transitions. And basically, you know, if we, we're in a quantum regime, if our system is truly isolated, then quantum fluctuations should dominate. And basically, uh, this would predict that the correlation length should grow as a power law um, with respect to the time that, 
you take, you know, how slow you go. And uh, the, um, uh, in, in the power, there is this combination of nu and z. This is known as a Kibble-Zurich exponent. So, for example, for the Ising model, you know, nu is actually equal to 1 and z is equal to 1. And this Kibble-Zurich uh, exponent should be 0 0.5. So it turns out that this actually value is very different from what's called classical Kibble-Zurich mechanism. And classical uh, Kibble-Zurich mechanism is for the systems which are in thermal equilibrium, which are coupled to the buff. You know, basically they are maintaining thermal equilibrium. In that case, actually it turns out this uh, value is one third. And uh, while there has been many experiments, you know, uh, probing this classical Kibble-Zurich exponent, ex including in particular the D-wave experiments, which were mentioned yesterday, you know, it turns out that up to now this quantum Kibble-Zurich mechanism has not been verified. And the reason is, yeah. The difference is not in. in in what sense is the quantum versus the classical Kibble-Zurich? Yeah, so basically, so this, you know, is prediction for the totally isolated system. So you start in a system which is isolated, you know, which doesn't have any contact with a reservoir. So here you start with a system which is in contact with reservoir. So you have coupling, you have basically equ equilibration. A, so that's a difference. Yeah. Okay, so the way how we uh, do these measurements is precisely by looking at the correlation functions. So, for example, in an ferromagnetic state, we have this, you know, kind of up, down, up, down, up, down correlations. And from there, for example, if you fit exponential decay, you can find the correlation length. And then what we can do is we can basically, you know, just change the ramp speed. So it's important to go linearly across. Uh, the slope should be linear. But, you know, we can change the ramp, ramp speed and then basically uh, you know, from that, by plotting, for example, correlation length as a function of this sweep time, you know, we can, we indeed see that our um, uh, correlation length scales um, uh, polynomially with the sweep time with the slope, which actually is quite close to the uh, 0.5. So it's actually a little bit higher than 0 0.5. I can actually maybe talk uh, about this l l later on. So, okay, so that's kind of shows that we can easily kind of verify this Kibble-Zurich prediction. But actually there is more to that than just this one plot. So what basically, you know, this, you know, in this kind of theory of quantum phase, phase transitions, universality is a big thing. So basically what this universality, you know, says is that so long as you're in this quantum critical regime, so all, you know, no matter basically, for example, with what speed you go, you should have the same result except for you do this rescaling. And what it means is that if we do this kind of rescaling with the speed, you know, all curves should collapse on one and we can do that. So this is again, this is this you know, envelope of this up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down correlation. And what you see indeed, you know, all of this, you know, so here is the data maybe for, I don't know, for 10 different speeds, they all very nicely uh, collapse. But actually, if you look at this, at this uh, curve carefully and this gray line is the exponential envelope, what you see is that something funny is going on. So actually, let me zoom it uh, up for you. So here, you know, even though all of these, you know, data points collapse to each other, they clearly deviate from the exponential. And actually, in fact, the correlation become negative. So we actually were kind of very puzzled initially. Um, but it turns out that there has been some predictions of this effect. And really, it shows that this Kibble-Zurich picture is a kind of is a, is, is a right picture, but it's only kind of very coarse grained picture. So once you start looking closely, what you see is that, you know, like there is some, you know, correlations between domain walls which are developing. So these correlations are actually uh, likely due to the interactions between the defects. And what's most important is that this kind of um, uh, result cannot be explained by just a thermal state. So basically what you do as you go here, you create a kind of non-thermal state. So, okay, I mean, we're sort of still in the beginning of exploring that, but already you can see that we can really study these systems at a very kind of new, it is sort of, I would say, somewhat even unprecedented level of, of accuracy. So let's, now having understood this transition, let's try to see what happens with these other transitions. These other transitions are kind of exotic. So um, in particular, uh, one way you, you could uh, do it is that you can change the interaction strength and then, you know, plot, for example, just a Fourier uh, transform of this kind of other parameter. So here the momentum is 0.5, which is corresponds to the Z2 state. So then, you know, if you increase the interaction strength, eventually you end up with the uh, 
uh, uh, with the period close to one third, you know, and here is, you know, maybe the period of one fourth emerging uh, slowly. There are also these transition points. So it basically shows you this a little bit. This phase diagram is not so simple, maybe. Uh, um, uh, 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 yes, it appears on the first glance. So, and in, actually, indeed, uh, it is not uh, uh, simple. So, in particular, these transitions into Z3 states have can be a different character depending where you cross it. And moreover, in between these phases, there is this other phase which is called incommensurate phase, where basically these different orders compete. And uh, one uh, thing, okay, so it's, you know, I don't want to go too much into details, but just kind of you give, want to give you a little bit of a taste. So one of these kind of interesting uh, um, uh, uh, domains here is corresponds to a so-called chiral clock model, which actually another kind of paradigmatic model of condensed matter physics, which actually was a PhD thesis of David Hughes, you know, and, you know, was studied for, for many, many years. So basically, this is associated with this transition to Z3 phase. And, you know, uh, the kind of intuition here is the following. So Z3, Z3, Z3 phase is in ordered uh, state every third uh, site is occupied. Uh, so in a kind of clock, it corresponds to uh, error pointing up. But then what can happen is that you can have two types of domain walls. You can either have a domain wall where one of these atoms is shifted to the left, so it's like clock going one direction, or it can be shifted to the right, which clocks go in the other direction. And actually, transition to this chiral clock model, it turns out to be very special, very exotic. And actually, in particular, it is described by the, by the field theory, which uh, does not have z equals to 1, which is actually very unusual. So it's non-relativistic field theory. So, uh, okay, so we can just try to measure this kibble zurich exponent uh, by going into this state. And uh, what we see uh, here is um, uh, the plot of this extracted kibble zurich exponent. So, uh, basically, two lines one can draw. One is this Ising line, and what I already indicated is actually you know, our data lies somewhat above mostly this kind of uh, value corresponding to 0 0.5. Uh, and there is also this another plateau which corresponds to the chiral clock model. And actually, you know, together with Subir, we really try to kind of push the envelope on the theory. And it, we have flu numerics, MPS, and finite size scaling. We get now the number for the chiral clock model, which is in a pretty good agreement. So uh, there is also this dip, and this dip, you know, we believe really corresponds to this incommensurate phase, where basically, you know, orders uh, compete. So basically, what we already see is that we can extract critical exponents for different transitions. We have some agreement with, with numerics, but this really pushes the state of the art of numerical simulation. And what's also important, we see effect of this long-range interaction, particularly this dip is due to long-range interaction. Also, the fact that this value is above 0.1, it looks like it's an indication of long-range interaction. So, okay, so what you see now is that we can now use our simulator as a kind of precision tool to, for studying uh, quantum critical uh, uh, phenomena. So, uh, uh, okay, what do we want to do with that? Clearly, we have a lot of work ahead of us. We'd like to extend it to 2D, improve coherence. We would like to start probing entanglement. So, it turns out that um, uh, some of these models which we realize have really some interesting topological properties. So, for example, we can realize Fibonacci onions. But what I'd like to really do now in this last, you know, few minutes is make a connection to the subject of the workshop, to the, you know, kind of near-term quantum algorithms. So, in particular, um, it turns out that our model pretty much directly implements um, a very important uh, class of uh, of, of problems uh, known as a maximum independent set. So what is maximum independent set? So suppose you have an um, uh, undirected graph where vertices are connected by the links. And basically, you know, an independent set uh, is a set of these colored vertices such that you know, no two connected vertices are colored at the same time. So this is, for example, an independent set. And this is another independent set. So, and basically, you know, the means problem is very simple. Just for a given graph, you know, find the largest independent set. So it turns out that for this graph, this is the largest independent set. This is a maximum independent set. But in general, this is actually a very hard problem. So it's actually NP. Uh, the problem itself is NP hard. Even in general, finding an approximate solution is uh, also NP complete. 
But what I would like to do here is I'd like to actually look at one specific uh, example of this miss, and this will be this miss on the unit disk graph. So basically, this is uh, an example shown here. So where we have all of his vertices, and they are connected so long as the two vertices are within um, uh, a certain uh, distance. So there are two things I would like to say about this. So first of all, you know, this kind of you know uh, graph should you know, look familiar to you. For example, in the back of your airline magazine, you know, you have example of this kind of network. So it turns out that this problem is an, is an important problem. And uh, moreover, it is still NP-complete, even for this unit disk graphs, you know. So uh, now if you followed what I've said previously about describing this Rydberg blockade and all of these ideas, and, you know, what you will realize is that this kind of uh, uh, problem, the solution of this problem, is nothing but the ground state of this Rydberg blockade Hamiltonian, where basically blockade radius is simply this D, right? You'd like to excite as many atoms as possible, but you cannot excite more than one. So, um, okay, it provides really kind of a starting point for us to think about what we can do. Uh, and, you know, certainly one can now think about either using a diabetic algorithm or perhaps, you know, applying kind of sequences of pulse gates of the kind that I also outlined. We can maybe think about implementing QUA. So we have now start, started to think, you know, a little bit how we actually implement it. So uh, something that I'm happy to talk to you. But kind of in the interest of time, let me just conclude by showing that, you know, this problem becomes very interesting once we go to the 2D arrays. And this is here we are now starting to trap atoms in two uh, dimensions, creating some arrays uh, of atoms and starting to rearrange uh, them. And I think this really is a very exciting frontier where, you know, many body physics, you know, uh, quantum control and quantum optimization can really, um, you know, work together uh, to do um, uh, something special. So I think I've used up my time. Uh, so I hope I gave you a little bit of a feeling about the state of the art of the of in, in this specific uh, area. So maybe the only thing that you know I must say here, you know, is that you know quantum information is now, of course, very exciting field. Uh, and, you know, quantum computing in particular. But what's kind of ironic is that, you know, we don't know how to really build truly large-scale quantum computers at the moment. And we also don't know, even if we build them, we don't know what they can be used for. But what my hope is that with these recent developments, we are now on the verge of building systems which are large enough, coherent enough, and programmable enough that we can really start finding out. And that's where maybe interactions between our communities could be particularly beneficial. Thank you very much. Um, what type of do you have any way to say what type of entanglement do you get in these uh, uh, um, results that you described with the Kibo's work? Uh, so, uh, so we have not characterized this. Uh, yeah, but but so theoretically, so it looks like, for example, both is you know examples of dynamics kind of you know far from equilibrium dynamics, and the one which uh, and is Kibble Zurich can be generally described by kind of matrix product states. So of course, qu close to quantum phase transition, you have to kind of push the bond dimension. Uh, high, but you know, generally these are these are matrix. I think they, at the end they can be described uh, very well by the matrix product uh, uh, state. So, uh, so in this case of this, uh, you know, far from equilibrium dynamic uh, dynamics, it turns out quite amazingly is that these kind of these oscillations, you know, uh, which we observe can be described by matrix product state to the leading order by matrix product instead of, of bond dimension two. So and this is actually where this kind of connection with quantum scars really, you know, uh, becomes relevant. So these are states with kind of very minimal amount of entanglement, where which where basically this entanglement, you know, does not really grow very rapidly. So of course, you know, if we if we wait for a long time, then we can no longer use it. So it, it, the of exactly, exactly, exactly. And this is kind of very, very interesting. So, I mean, I, I can, you know, actually, let's see. Or okay. maybe show you a little bit what is. Yeah, so the, the interesting uh, 
Okay, so that's kind of the interesting results, the result involving this, uh, this quantum scar uh, discussion. So, so basically entanglement, let me just, so I'll show maybe the result of some simulations to This is one example. Uh, now it's a simulation for 25 atoms, and it's already one had to do some tricks to do these numerics because it's a constrained Hamiltonian, uh, which actually we sort of once we observed, once we had experimental observations, we tried to make sense of them. And what you see here is when one, one does this kind of rapid quenches, it turns out that you know depending on the state, you either have uh, you know, very kind of rapid decay of these oscillations and kind of very rapid growth of entanglement. Or alternatively, you have this kind of oscillations which are which exist really for a very long time and they correspond, okay, this is maybe a quant, so here is an entanglement entropy of half of the chain. But you know, what you see here is for this constrained Hamiltonian, this entanglement grows very, very slowly, right? And But if you look, I mean, if you look at individual sort of pairs, what you see is that it oscillates. So you create local entanglement and it comes back, you know? So there are certainly very interesting entanglement structures which emerge in this, in this, uh, uh, in these systems. And actually what is kind of also pretty special is we have ways to measure them, you know? And we have not done it yet, but this is something that we are now working on. So maybe we'll same questions for discussion in the afternoon. Okay. What time is that?